This is the story of the killer of Hampton Roads. Elton Manning Jackson was accused of strangling up to 12 gay men in Norfolk, Virginia. I will narrate the entire story, so if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. From 1987 to 1996, 12 gay or bisexual men were strangled to death and dumped in an area of Virginia called Hampton Roads. All but one were found nude, most had been strangled, the others were too decomposed for the cause of death to be determined. Of the victims, all were last seen at gay bars in Portsmouth or Norfolk. The last of the 12 victims was Andrew D. Smith, who was 38 at the time, whose nude body was found on the side of the road in Chesapeake. The accused at the time, Elton Manning Jackson, had been taken into custody quietly at his house the same day he was indicted. Court papers unsealed in the coming days said that he had been a friend of the victim since childhood, but he had lied to the police when under questioning. Jackson acknowledged through his attorney that he had had consensual sex with Andrew Smith shortly before Smith's body was found. He pled not guilty to the charge and said he didn't kill any of the previous other 11 victims. Now the arrest came to seem like a break that dissolved into ambiguities and led straight into a sex and drug subculture into which men retreat precisely so they can shed their everyday identities. We go back to June 28, 1993, the body of a young black man who was discovered in a ditch beside a rural road in Chesapeake. Chesapeake, a city of around 180,000 just south of Norfolk, where Mr. Fischetti, working his first day as a homicide detective, took one look at the ligature mark around the victim's neck and said to himself, here we go again. This required no great powers of deduction. There had been six similar killings dating back to August 1987, where the body of Charles Frank Smith turned up in Chesapeake. A year later, the body of Joseph Ray was found also in Chesapeake. Others followed sporadically, Stacy Renew in January 1989, John W. Ross Jr. in January 1992, Billy Lee Dixon, found in Isle of Wight County, west of Norfolk in August 1992, and Reginald Joyner, found in Suffolk, a city 20 miles west of Chesapeake in March 1993. The victim discovered on Fischetti's first day was identified as Raymond Bostick, 27 years old, an unemployed truck driver from Norfolk. Like the others, he had lived a somewhat transient life, either socially or geographically, or both. Like the others, he had died of strangulation, yet his corpse showed no signs of struggle. His body was found nude, like all the others except Charles Smith, who had turned up in his jeans and sneakers. Bostick also shared in the others' ultimate fate. Sometimes after he died, his body had been dumped by the roadside in a spot that was both secluded and well traveled. It was the kind of spot that offered the dumper some privacy, but ensured that the body would not go undiscovered for long. As the years passed, the killer did not deviate from this pattern. Clearly, the killer perfected the disposing of his victims without leaving much physical evidence. But working backward in time from the point of disposal, there were other signs of formidable intelligence. Some of the bodies were more decomposed than others suggesting that the killer kept them for a while, in some cases for a few days, without being found out. His method of killing, strangulation, by his bare hands, requires substantial strength and perhaps some training. More baffling was the fact that none of the corpses show any sign of struggle. Even the weakest of strangulation victims will resist, and in their resistance will often get the killer's blood or skin under their fingernails. The absence of any such evidence on the corpses suggested strongly that the killer had found some way to immobilize his victims. Blood tests turned up some of the victims had been drinking and doing cocaine, but others hadn't. It was only after Raymond Bostick's homicide, the seventh victim, that police concluded that it and the others were the work of a single killer. For one thing, this killer's signature was relatively subtle, lacking in sensational disfigurement or satanic scrawlings. For another, the bodies had been dumped in different jurisdictions. The FBI's Child Abduction and Serial Killer Unit would provide detailed DNA testing and create a psychological profile of the killer. Mr. Fischetti, despite his short tenure in homicide, remained the lead investigator. 
Within months after Bostick's body was found, Bichetti's caseload started to expand. In September 1993, the body of Robert Neal was dumped beside another road in Chesapeake. A year later, the body of Garland Taylor Jr. was found in Suffolk. In May 1995, Samuel Aliff turned up dead in Chesapeake, followed by Jesse James Spencer, found in Chesapeake in January 1996. And then, of course, Andrew Smith in July. Gradually, Fischetti became obsessed with finding the killer. Forensic evidence, hairs, fibers, medical data, and the like was either uncollected in the earlier cases or inconclusive in later ones. But it is a truism of social murder investigations that the killer will reveal himself through his victims. So the police turned to investigating how the dead had lived. Here too, they kept running out of leads that went nowhere. Norfolk and Portsmouth had seen some homicides of unusual violence or terrifying circumstances, but its murder rate, 150 per year, in a population of more than 1.5 million, is extraordinarily low for an urbanized area. In Portsmouth, men cruised for sex or drugs in a two block area of a neighborhood called Truxton. As far as the police could tell, all of the victims were last seen or known to frequent one of these three neighborhoods. But what the 12 men have in common is not homosexuality or ambiguous sexuality, so much as their lack of constant relationship with a job or a community or a schedule. Billy Lee Dixon, victim number five, posed for pictures in gay erotic magazines, but his brother David said he never discussed his sexual orientation. Robert Neal, victim number eight, had two children and he had talked about moving in with them and their mother. But Pam Morgan, the mother of Robert Neal's kids, said he was a cracked addict and would disappear for days at a time and then show up hungry, drugged and sleep deprived. Coincidentally, she also said she told police that Neal had had a friend named Elton. Garland Taylor Jr., victim number nine, had married shortly before he disappeared and his parents insisted that he was neither homosexual nor a drug user. Although 12 men disappeared from or near the Tidewaters adult playgrounds, that alone isn't very telling. In each place, the population changes from night to night and includes people from across the social, racial and sexual spectrums. In January 1996, Fischetti spent several nights combing Granbury Street for leads in the killing of Jesse James Spencer, who was victim number 11. This was the police trying to get closer to the lives of the victims. By canvassing the neighborhood, Fischetti was able to turn up some people who had seen Spencer in his last hours. He was drinking and smoking crack. He downed some beers at Perry's Lounge. He hit the street and climbed into a shiny maroon Ford Explorer with silver five-spoke mag wheels. The driver was a heavy-set black man and a diamond cluster ring on his left ring finger. And they were probably headed to Top Hat, a transvestite club nearby, but after that, Fischetti hit a wall. He found nobody who could play Spencer at the Top Hat. Nor could he find more about this man with a ring on his finger and driving a maroon explorer. Long before he started running into dead ends on Granby Street, now it didn't help that in 1994, Virginia's gay community had been terrorized by Gary Ray Bowles, a male prostitute accused of robbing and killing well-heeled older gay men from Washington to Florida. The task force had little evidence from the victim bodies and few hard leads coming from the street. It did have two psychological profiles, however, of the killer, one from the state police and one from FBI. Larry McCann, a special agent with the state police in Richmond, developed one of the profiles for the task force. He said, What I found was that the victims lived in a fascinating area I had never encountered before. He said, It is a world where the heterosexual world of sex overlaps with the homosexual world. The question is, how would the lives of the people in this world come in contact with the offender? What he is trying to say here is back then, the FBI assumed that sexual orientation was slightly race driven. So for example, if you identified as gay and you were black, you would be into black men. And if you were white, you'd be into white men. Therefore, a serial killer who was white would generally target white men. This was the thinking of the FBI back then. 
Now, as McCann read the crime scenes, or rather, the dump sites, he had little trouble placing this killer into one of two basic categories recognized by experts. The method of dumping, the removal of physical evidence, the lack of signs of struggle, all suggested considerable cunning and forethought. A disorganized serial killer generally strikes an impulse and with little regard for whether he will be caught. This killer, McCann concluded, is capable of making and executing plans. He is organized. His first five victims were white, but five of the next seven were black. And this is what blurred the police when they generally looked for clues. Based solely on the physical evidence and the profile, the killer is a man who is cunning enough to cover his tracks, strong enough to choke victims of considerable size, and verbally facile enough to seduce his victims into a situation that he controls. But then, a Virginia power company employee discovered Andrew Smith's body in a ditch on July 22nd. The corpse was unclothed, an autopsy would establish that Smith had died of ligature strangulation. The police quickly learned that Smith, who was 38, had also lived with his mother in Truxton. He had hung around with Garland Taylor Jr., victim number 9, at a quick shop in Portsmouth. When police canvassed Smith's neighbourhood, they learned that Smith was acquainted with Elton Jackson and that Jackson lived on Portsmouth Boulevard within a half mile of Smith. Police were told that around 10pm on July 20th, Smith had left his mother's house intending to borrow money from Jackson so he could engage the services of a prostitute. About 29 hours later, his body was discovered. On July 23rd, police went to Jackson's house to question him. It was then that Jackson said he didn't know Smith and that he had heard of his death through the TV news. Police initiated a background check of Jackson, during which he learned that a local credit agency had Jackson's Ford Escort. On August 22nd, the detective bought the car, apparently to keep it in police custody. At that point, FBI agents were brought in to search the Escort. In the car's ashtray, they found six cigarette butts. On the butts, an FBI forensic examiner found material from which he could extract DNA. It matched DNA extracted from Smith's corpse. Later, the police sought warrants to search Jackson's house and his person. After the warrants were issued, police took samples of Jackson's blood, saliva, pubic hair, and cranial hair. They also seized 34 items from his house, including a gold belt, cigarette butts, more cigarette butts, a gay newspaper, and three bottles of cologne. When police arrived at Jackson's house on May 6th, he denied again knowing Smith again, but submitted to arrest without incident. After further questioning at the police station, he acknowledged that he had known Smith. He also told police that he had engaged in intercourse with Smith on the night of July 20th, but said he didn't kill him. At his arraignment, bond was set at $100,000. During the trial, Arnold Smith, a friend of the last victim, Andrew Smith, testified that between 2.30am and 3am on July 21st, 1996, the victim said he was going to go past Elton's house to get some money. Kim Nurney, another friend of Andrew's, also testified that at around 2.30am on July 21st, 1996, the victim told her he was leaving to go get some money and would be back in 15 minutes, but he never returned. Elton Manning Jackson took the stand in his own defense and testified that he lied to police about knowing his victim because he feared he would be charged with a murder he didn't commit. Elton said, I was scared and afraid. I'm black. I'm gay. But I did have a nice time that weekend, and then he turns up dead. Elton Manning Jackson was sentenced to life in prison for the 1996 strangling of Andrew Smith. Evidence presented during the trial showed that Jackson kept Smith's body for eight or more hours before dumping him on a back road in Chesapeake. Okay, so now we come to my thoughts and conclusion on this story. But before we do, let's have a look at sadism in more detail. There are several assumptions and theories surrounding what might inspire sexually sadistic tendencies. And there are further more theories surrounding what might influence these tendencies to become a disorder. Although these, of course, do not apply to everybody. One such theory for the development of sadistic tendencies is that sadism can be explained through the lens of operant conditioning. This theory looks at sadism as a learned behavior perhaps the result of an individual watching particularly sadistic porn whilst masturbating and thereby creating an association between witnessing pain and feeling pleasure. 
This theory suggests that over a period of time, an individual might learn to become sadistic as a result of the stimulus reward dynamic. An American study by Tell Me What You Want, surveying 4,175 participants, found that sadistic tendencies correlated significantly with a variety of other traits, for example, sensation seeking, risk taking, and an overactive imagination. The study also found that those exhibiting sadistic tendencies tended to have an unrestricted sociosexual orientation essentially meaning that they found it easier to differentiate between sex and emotion. These findings make sense due to the fact that highly empathetic people would likely struggle seeing someone else in pain, whereas those who distinctly see sex and emotions as two very separate things would perhaps find it easier to therefore inflict sexual pain onto somebody when in a mutually consensual environment. But the interesting thing to note about these findings is that the study also suggested that sadistic fantasies in men often correlated with lower self-esteem or higher attachment anxiety. Okay, so to me, Elton was clearly sadistic. He enjoyed inflicting pain onto other people somehow. In his life, his sexual proclivities and his pain thrill-seeking, if you like, managed to collide and become one. Elton also enjoyed being in a position of power and to be in control, which is why when he met his victims, he wanted to pay them, or he did pay them, to agree to them being tied up etc and to them it was just a fantasy sexual experience but for him he knew exactly what he was about to do now when it comes to being thrilling i imagine elton would consistently think about what he would do with his victims as a way of keeping his mind stimulated see in life sometimes the thrill of victory is better than victory itself victory in this sense is a metaphor it's like with gambling addicts the the chase is better than the end result. And it seemed to me what Elton would do is roam the streets in his car and he'd find that thrilling, the idea that he can meet a man, engage in sexual activity and then perhaps strangle them to death was very gratifying. Unfortunately, in this case, not only the thrill of victory was great, victory itself was great. Again, victory in this sense is a metaphor. I don't mean it literally. Now, it is unclear out what caused this corruption inside of Elton. And I say corruption, I'm referring to the sadism there, of course, as there's not much video footage of Elton himself. In fact, I didn't find any video footage of him. And given the fact that I myself live in Virginia, so I know the state very well, in places like Norfolk, Portsmouth and Chesapeake, there's not going to be any cameras or, or any great cameras or, any, or much video footage of anything that took place in the 90s. But the controlling aspect is further amplified by the fact that Elton preyed on drug addicts, men who felt alone, men who didn't really have many friends, and were seeking an escape from life. For example, earlier, when the man who had a wife or an ex-wife and kids would continually be drugged and live a life of the homeless. So in reality, there's not much more analysis I can make on Elton, given the lack of research or the lack of evidence or, or the lack of like, I, I didn't manage to find anything from Elton. No video footage or anything for me to feel a kind of energy to see what is this guy all about. Except from learning what the crimes were and that he just enjoyed inflicting pain. So why don't you comment, tell me what you think of Elton. What kind of mind do you think he had? I mean, maybe he was inflicted a lot of pain when he was a child. Who knows? Either way, thank you for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.